I'm Forrest Maltzman, the chair of the search committee, and I am honored to kick off the introduction of our new provost, Professor Steve Lerman. Before President Knapp introduces Steve, I want to tell you a little bit about the search and to thank the many people who helped us get here today. First, I want to acknowledge the members of the search committee, and I'm going to call them out by name. They've spent a tremendous amount of time uh, interviewing candidates, doing reference checks, uh, and in meetings. So the search committee members are Dean David Dawling and Dean Mike Brown, the head of the faculty senate, Lillian Robinson, professors Alan Wade and Diana Lipscomb from Columbian College, Marty Finnamore from the Elliott School, Alan Greenberg from the School of Public Health, Arnie Schwartz from the Medical School, Tony Marsh from the College of Professional Studies, Tom Mizuchi from the School of Engineering, David Schwant from the Education School, Art Wilmarth from the Law School, Jack Sig, I'm sorry, Phil Wirtz from the Business School, Jack Siggins, the University Librarian, Beth Nolan, the University's General Counsel, Barbara Porter, President Knapp's Chief of Staff, and Lydia Thomas, Chair of the Board's Academic Affairs Committee. And I also want to thank our search consultant, Eileen Nagel, and her assistant, Grisano Waldup, and four members of President Knapp's staff, Deanne Hybee, Kelly Leone, Gloria McGee, and especially Robert Luke, who spent literally hundreds of hours coordinating this search and never dropped the ball once. This was both an exciting and exhausting search. We began with over 200 nominations and ended up conducting over 20 airport interviews over three and a half days. In the end, we brought four individuals to campus. It was an amazing pool that included numerous people who had spectacular academic records and a great deal of administrative experience at some of the nation's most prominent universities. President Knapp, at my request, graciously took the time to meet with each of the candidates who came in for an airport interview, as well as those, obviously, who came to campus, and to explain to them both his vision for the university and for the position. Given the quality of the pool, we felt that this was an important part of the process to make sure that the candidates were as enthusiastic about GW as I suspect all of us are. During our first day of airport interviews, Steve Lerman came through. And when he left, one of the committee members, Alan Greenberg, looked at me and said, wow. Another member of our committee asked whether it would be appropriate to simply call the search to a close and stop right there. It was not, and we ended up bringing four individuals who had a wow factor to campus. After the campus interviews, the committee members each cast a secret ballot to formulate an unranked list to pass on to the president. And at this point, I think it is safe to reveal that there was unanimity within the committee that Steve Lerman would make an excellent provost. When President Knapp gave his charge to the search committee, he made clear that he wanted us to find someone whose academic record would be respected and that he wanted a provost with the energy, vision, creativity, and diplomatic skills to implement a transformative agenda. Although it was clear that the individual that we would select would obviously come from one field in which they had done their own work, it was also important to the committee that we find someone who we felt understood the plurality of the GW uh, campus. I am convinced that with the appointment of Steve Lerman, the search committee has fulfilled its charge. I went into this bullish on GW, and I am even more so now. The search of success reflects both the talented pool that is there and the quality of Steve Lerman, but it also reflects something else, and that is the personal investment that President Knapp made in it. I want to thank him for being so engaged and, making, and helping us in so many different steps along the way to make sure that we could bring this to a successful close. And on that note, I am pleased to introduce President Stephen Knapp. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm very much appreciative of the uh, presentation uh, that uh, 
Professor Maltzman just gave, I think he gave an excellent uh, overview of the search process. I really have, I can't add anything to what he said about that process, uh, which was, I think, handled uh, extraordinarily uh, well, professionally, uh, with great integrity and, and uh, concentrated effort, uh, thanks in large measure to Professor Maltzman and his colleagues who just put so much uh, dedicated work into this process. And I'm very grateful on behalf of the Board of Trustees and the entire university for, uh, for the work that they did. I would like, before I begin my introduction of the person you really want to see this morning, uh, I'd like to single out one individual for a particular recognition and thanks, and that's Dr. Donald Lehman, who's in the front row here, who at the end of this year will have served 14 years as Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs of the University. Uh, I've said many times and uh, publicly and will say, have opportunities again in the course of this year to thank him for uh, the critical role that he played in my transition into this position from another institution. Uh, he's given me tremendous support and of course has this year, while we've been conducting the search for his successor, has I, th I think just done an excellent job uh, keeping everything uh, operating smoothly and um, uh, I've enjoyed continuing to work with him and will do so for the remainder of this academic year and then he's gonna remain on as a special advisor to me until his formal retirement, which is in December. So Don, thank you very much for everything you've done for the George Washington University. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it is now my pleasure to introduce Steve Lerman as George Washington University's next provost and executive vice president for academic affairs and as the A. James Clark Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And in mentioning that faculty title, I did want to just take a moment to say that uh, this professorship has been occupied by a distinguished member of the faculty of the School of Engineering and Applied Science, Professor Gideon Frieder, and he is retiring at the end of this academic year, which of course makes this uh, chair available to another distinguished colleague, and I was delighted that uh, this, by the coincidence of timing, that enabled us to offer this distinguished professorship uh, named for a former trustee of the university and a very uh, distinguished member of the business community here, very active, in fact, you see his cranes uh, Jim Clark's cranes up in our Square 54 project every day as you walk by there. Uh, there, I think the, those are the white cranes there across from the blue cranes, which are the Miller and Long cranes. But he is, he, at any given time, uh, Jim Clark has something like 25 projects going on in the, in the Washington area. And so it's, I think it's great that he is himself a civil engineer and that uh, this professorship name for him will now uh, be bestowed on our new provost and executive vice president for academic affairs. Uh, our, our, our new provost serves currently as vice chancellor and dean for graduate education at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is also the class of 1922 distinguished professor of civil and environmental engineering. Uh, earlier in his career, he served at MIT in quite a number of roles. Uh, early on, he was the really the founding director and the spirit behind Project Athena, which was the first integrated educational environment in computing environment at any US university. He has served as director of the MIT Singapore Alliance, director of the Intelligent Engineering Systems Laboratory, and did actually a couple of different terms as chair of the faculty, uh, in which role I think he learned a great deal about uh, the kind of shared governance that we have uh, with our faculty here at George Washington. And I think all of those uh, kinds of experiences stand him in good stead for assuming this position. He and his wife, Lori, and Lori is here today, right up here, and uh, Lori, welcome to the George Washington family. Great to have you here with us this morning. Uh, they actually currently are housemasters at a graduate residence at MIT, and at George Washington, they will live in the alumni house at the Mount Vernon campus and be very much a part of the campus life there. And that will, I think, uh, do a great deal to help us integrate our student experience and our strategic focus across our two campuses here in Washington, both the Foggy Bottom campus and the Mount Vernon campus. Uh, Steve Lerman's scholarship has focused on a number of different areas in which he has published extensively on multimedia educational software, 
computer applications in education, transportation systems analysis, and again, he's ex published extensively in those areas. He's received numerous awards for his efforts as a member of the faculty at MIT, including Advisor of the Year from the National Association of Graduate and Professional Students, and also the Massey Teaching Award for his work with students at MIT. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our next provost, uh, Dr. Steve Lerman. Thank you all. Uh, I normally don't actually write out the text of speeches, but I have to say that in this particular instance, uh, in one of the rare times in my life, uh, I was concerned I wouldn't be able to put together everything I wanted to say in one coherent presentation. Uh, normally when I lecture to my courses, of course, I just have you know, six bullet points and it goes an hour. Uh, this will be a long text and it will go much, much shorter. Uh, so I thought you'd, uh, you'd all appreciate that, what you signed up for when you walked in the room. But I have to tell you how honored and proud I am to stand here today to be the incoming provost of George Washington University. It's difficult to express how excited my wife Lori and I are at the prospect of becoming part of this wonderful community of faculty, staff, and students. From the very start of this search process, and Forrest has talked about it, uh, everyone we've met has welcomed us and feel, made us feel home at home at George Washington University. And to be honest, when I first visited here as, as part of the first uh, interview, what they call the airport interviews, I realized as soon as I finished that interview how much I wanted to come here. And uh, while I, of course, didn't tell everybody this as part of the, uh, the negotiation process, Basically, you had me then. Uh, this is just an extraordinary place. Uh, this is a university with an incredible history of academic accomplishment and a service to the nation and the world. Uh, becoming part of President Knapp's senior leadership team and part of the illustrious history of George Washington University is for me an opportunity of a lifetime. Over the coming months, weeks, years, uh, I hope to meet with as many of you as possible to understand the goals and aspirations of the university and to help President Knapp in marshalling the university's considerable resources and energies towards achieving our collective goals. I think most of you know I come from a university, MIT, that at least on the surface is quite different from George Washington, particularly in the areas it emphasizes. MIT is a much more specialized place uh, it focuses on a small range of disciplines uh, and is smaller in terms of student body uh, and has a much larger research program and endowment. As a consequence of having a large engineering school, it is much more involved with the private sector, particularly with respect to entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial in, uh, work in the technological areas. George Washington University, of course, has these same areas of study, but has far greater depth and breadth in the arts, humanities, and social sciences. It has broad and deep programs within its professional schools, and an extraordinary tradition of public service to the United States and to the larger world. However, despite those differences, I actually believe that there are far more commonalities between the two universities. And what I hope to do is bring whatever I've had the good fortune to learn to MIT, to adapt it, to serve George Washington University as best I can. The truth is, all great universities, such as MIT and George Washington University, accomplish everything they do within a mission that rests on three clear pillars. The education of the next generation, the advancement of human knowledge, and service to the larger community. I conceptualize my job as provost as helping the faculty, staff, and students here realize their aspirations in each of those three areas. Within the broad vision set forth by President Knapp and Don Lehman and the Faculty Senate and all of you here in this room and all of your colleagues outside this room, I hope to work 
to build a consensus around GW, how we can enhance our leadership position in all the fields of scholarship that this university spans. We're fortunate to be able to build on GW's considerable existing strengths. I look forward with working to you, I look forward to working with you together to translate the goals we collectively set into decisions about how best to use the monetary, human, and physical resources of GW to best serve our mission. In the final analysis, it's important to recognize that it won't be the senior leadership of the university that does much of any of the great teaching, the groundbreaking research, or the desperately needed service to our country and to the entire world. The role of the, of the university's leadership isn't to do those things, but rather to enable the rest of the community to accomplish that work as best they can. This means we need to help attract the best faculty, staff, and students, create world-class facilities for them to work in, help every member of the faculty become as effective an educator and mentor as possible, give our students the resources they need to learn from the faculty and to learn from each other, to create a climate of inclusion so that the absolute best people in the world aspire to come here, and ensure that each individual in the community is valued for the work they do and the potential they have for great achievement. If we can do these things, great things will happen here, and GW will continue to grow in stature and its value to society. Some of you have asked me what my first steps will be during my startup as provost. I intend to spend most of my time trying to learn as much as I can from all of you. I hope to meet with many of you as possible in the next few months to understand your work, the GW organization, and how things really get done here. In my experience, universities aren't well described by things like organization charts. Rather, in my experience, the work of a great university gets done through a complex web of interpersonal relationships, understanding how a consensus is built, who to consult with, and how best to communicate with key, key uh, stakeholders on any issue, and then finding the common ground within a context of mutual respect in reaching and implementing decisions is what I view as central to effective leadership. I will spend a great deal of time listening to as many of you as I can and exploring your ideas and aspirations for George Washington. I welcome your ideas and suggestions, and I welcome your candid views on the strengths and weaknesses of our university and your best advice on how I should devote my time and energy over the coming years. I firmly believe that GW is poised to do even greater things in the future, and I'm enormously honored that I can be part of accomplishing those things with you. Finally, I'd like to thank the trustees, the search committee, all of the faculty, staff, and students I met with during the lengthy interview process, and President Knapp for having the confidence in me to give me this opportunity. I will always be cognizant of the responsibility I have to do whatever I can to deserve your trust and your confidence. I believe the best days of this university are yet to come. There are great things just waiting for us to do. Thank you all. You want to stay and answer questions? To quote my good friend Alan Greenberg, wow. Uh, what uh, we're going to do now is take questions, and, and I'm happy to moderate uh, as we go here. But we've set up some microphones here, and uh, I think people should go ahead and ask any and all questions that they would like. I was just wondering what you've heard about our sponsored research uh, programs and efforts here, and how you envision you might be able to assist us in, in growing research at GW. Well, it's certainly the case that uh, one difference in the scale, is the scale of research programs between where I come from and now my new home, George Washington. And I certainly, one of my aspirations is to work with the faculty to find all the ways we can to enable the faculty to expand their research activities wherever that makes sense. And 
I don't envision that as, a, gee, every unit has to grow its research. I don't think that's the right way. I think that there are areas in, of strength at GW which could uh, grow its research programs to enable the faculty to uh, undertake more research in areas that are important. Uh, I think, yeah, we, we often talk about growing the research volume, and we always have to remember, we often measure research by, well, how much research money comes in. But the truth is, research money always has to be thought of as a means to the end. The end is to make it possible to create new knowledge, to discover new things. The money itself is simply a tool, an instrument that makes the end possible. And to the extent I think there are areas of research at GW where the faculty aspires to broaden and deepen the research program, to the extent I can be at all helpful coming from a more research-centric culture, particularly one that is actually, on average, pretty good at obtaining the, the tools necessary to do research, the funding. Uh, to the extent that experience is useful, I'm willing and able and happy to be a, a partner with the various groups in the faculty. This is more a comment that you may react to than a question, but uh, this university had a long time president before we were delighted to have uh, President Knapp come to three years ago, a long time essentially provost, uh, 14 years as uh, we heard earlier. Um, I think it's very important that you not jump into details early, but think what things are being done and not being done that may, would make this a great university. Uh, we don't have a strength, in my opinion, expressed it <laughs> elsewhere, uh, uh, in long-term strategic planning. Uh, I think it would be a beautiful thing to spend a substantial part of your time and no details, but just dreaming yourself, you know, what would make this, you know, a uh, really great university. Well, I appreciate that. and. Uh it is easy in all academic leadership, and I really can't tell you, I, you know, I can express in detail how that applies to George Washington, but in general, the modern university uh, has become an increasingly complex organization to run, and there's always the danger for anyone in a senior leadership position, and I certainly have observed this at MIT, to get completely preoccupied with the day-to-day -day details. In general, my experience is the day-to-day -day details tend to draw your focus, because some of them are very immediate, and you sort of have to deal with them. And as those accumulate, sometimes you begin to lose the time to deal with what, as you point out, what I would call the bigger picture issues. Uh, I think for me, and again, I can't give you any specifics, part of the key, of course, is having a strong team with the confidence that many of the day-to-day -day details can be dealt with effectively without requiring enormous amounts of time from the senior leadership. My hope is to be that person for President Knapp, and my hope is to use the people who are here and perhaps other people who aren't here uh, to enable that to happen in a well-functioning university. The other, of course, counter danger is over-delegation, where the leadership becomes detached from the actual things the faculty, students, and staff are most concerned with by, by you know, being sort of in the ivory tower when everybody else is trying to you know, run the ivory tower. And, uh, I think that's the other danger, and it's a very careful balancing act. Uh, all I can do is uh, say that I'm aware of it, I'm going to do my best to, to run that narrow line, and I guess I'm relying on everybody else to come into my office to say, if I f you feel like I'm missing that mark, come in and tell me. Uh, the other thing I think you need to know about me is that um, I generally don't take criticism personally, uh, even when some people occasionally aren't happy with me. Uh, which I have to say occasionally occurs, but, but I think it's important to create a climate of trust in which people can walk in and say, I know you're doing this, and here's the reasons I think it's a mistake, and people can agree, uh, respectfully disagree with each other, and I, all I can promise is I will listen when that happens. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. Welcome to GW. My name is Bernard Demchuk, and I do DC government relations in the external relations department. Um, Quick question on diversity. The president has given us a new charge of increasing diversity. 
um, making it stronger, making it deeper, broadening it. Uh, your thoughts on diversity mm -hmm. would be appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I certainly was trying to allude to that when I talked in this speech about what I call creating the climate of inclusion. For me, the climate of inclusion uh, that one wants to create is, is so that we can effectively recruit a diverse cross-section. The goal of diversity it is itself, of course, a, a noble goal. But I'd like to think that this is one of those cases where the university can not only serve that goal, but do itself a favor. We want a university in which every person who brings something to the table wants to come here. And for us, I think that means being as diverse in our recruiting, both for students and for staff and for faculty, as we can. Uh, this is an area, actually, I've been very involved with in my work as Dean uh, of Graduate Education uh, in, at MIT. Uh, and what I found is one of the key factors in convincing, in this case, graduate students uh, from underrepresented minority groups, for example, to come to MIT uh, has been making sure that they are contacted directly and that they feel welcome. Uh, when people are a small part of a larger population, such as an often case underrepresented minority students, particularly actually in the sciences and the engineering fields, they need to feel that they are wanted and will be treated as full members of the community. And very often, all it takes is a, someone to reach out to them, a faculty member making a phone call. Uh, a group of students welcoming them when they get their admissions letters and writing to them. Uh, and then, of course, giving them the actual support, delivering on the promise, which is when they come, that they have the support uh, and feel fully included, included as members of the community. I think that doing that consciously, in mind, and then, of course, seeing what the outcomes are, looking at whether the university is doing better or worse in those areas, uh, can make a true difference. Uh, again, with the help of people who work in my office, we were able to increase the number of matriculating underrepresented minority students at the graduate level by 43% uh, in two and a half years, or two years, two admission cycles. Uh, we were at the undergraduate level uh, by, again, basically pursuing the best and the brightest students and making them welcome and feel like they want to be part of our community, uh, we were able to increase the number uh, of underrepresented minority students to almost reflect the population as a whole of the United States. So these are things that can be done. Uh, it takes a will. It takes persistence. In the case of faculty diversity, it is not a one-year fix because faculty, no matter what you do, turn over rather slowly, and it takes multiple years of sustained attention. But with that attention, one can make changes. And I certainly view uh, part of, of my job here is partnering with the deans and department heads, where after all, uh, the recruiting actually happens, to help work through what in those disciplines, their own fields, are the best processes so that we attract a diverse faculty. Uh, so with that in mind, my, my, my sense is this will be a project that will span probably the entire time that I'm the provost and uh, President Knapp's the president, and something we hope to hand to whoever follows us uh, having made real progress, uh, and that the composition of the faculty, staff, and students will change over time to reflect the diversity of the nation. Please. Uh, good morning, Dr. Lerman, and welcome to GW. Uh, I'm Mike Tapscott. I'm with the Multicultural Student Services Center. And I wanted to ask you about your philosophy on faculty and student engagement, uh, co-curricular programming, and how you build on uh, those relationships and if they're a priority for you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, one of, uh, well, as you might guess from the fact I live in a dorm, uh, I spend a lot of time with students. Uh, but of course, not every faculty member can. In fact, not every faculty member wants to. And for many faculty, it would not be the right decision. Uh, it depends on your interest, your stage in life. But my wife, Lori, and I spend enormous amounts of time working with students. Uh, she has run an incredibly uh, successful music program within our dorm, actually, and actually having graduate students uh, 
come, take music lessons, perform in the dorm. Now you might recognize that you know, at, my, at MIT, we don't have a lot of music majors. They're, in fact, you know, there are some undergraduates who double major in music, and none of the graduate students, of course, we have no graduate program. So for them, this is a co-curricular activity. We have found students desperately want that connection to the faculty. Uh, you know, casual events which engage faculty. Um, we, uh, for I'll give you an example. Uh, a few weeks ago, my wife, Lori, organized a jazz brunch in the dorm. So we brought in a jazz combo, and they performed. We did brunch. Food always seems to attract groups of students, uh, <laughs> as I'm sure you all know. Uh, but it wasn't just an entertainment event. We then, uh, she then had the, the musicians talk about the process of making music and how they worked together and how they thought about their music. And the students, none of whom will ever be professional musicians, trust me, uh, <laughs> but the students were fascinated because they were exposed to a domain of knowledge that they had never even known about. Uh, and, and, and I think faculty can do those things. You don't have to live in the dorm to organize something like that. Faculty can work with uh, various co-curricular groups. The students have an enormous thirst to get to know us outside the classroom. So what are the ways to make that happen? Um, one uh, thing I talk to often with the search committee is I think we need as much as possible to engage our undergraduates in particular in our research. And that is not just research in labs or research uh, of, the, of the form of going into the chemistry department and doing research there. In some ways, every faculty member is a scholar and has some component of research. Students can get to know us in very different ways when we work as colleagues on research that are so different than when they're students in our classroom. And for many students, that can be an important new relationship with a faculty member. And we need to incentivize that for the faculty. Uh, one of the things I hope to look at is can we build some funds that enable students to do that for pay so that faculty don't have to go out and find money for those students. Some students can do it for credit, but we have to recognize that some students actually need to be able to work, but why can't their work be in, uh, as a colleague if we can raise the money for that and help the faculty fund the student? In some cases, sponsored research funds can be used, but of course not everybody has those. Uh, we need to make resources available. So one of the things I really do want to look at is can we facilitate that program by providing some funding uh, and give those students uh, at GW that opportunity to interact with a faculty member in a very different way. Uh, I hope that was enough of an answer. I think it's a broad swath, of, but it's, um, you know, it's obviously an area that's an integral part of the educational experience for our students. And if we ignore it, we do so at our peril. Tony? Um, that last question was actually similar to what I was going to ask you, so I'll ask you to expand a little bit. One of the attractive things in your resume to us was your involvement with the student body and um, your involvement with the, the whole campus experience. So I would ask you to talk a little bit about your views and your plans um, as, um, as far as campus life, the campus experience, um, the whole campus experience for students. Well. I have to say, one of the, I told that story that you know, the day I came to interview uh, was the day you had me if you wanted me, uh, the first interview. And I think the opportunity to live on the campus, in this case the Mount Vernon campus, was very much part of that. You know, Lori and I have spent the last nine years of our lives living with students. I'm not sure I know how to live with adults as neighbors anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, to be honest, it's, it's incredibly exhilarating. And I think we want to be, uh, part of that entire community. Uh, certainly by being a presence on the Mount Vernon campus, we hope to be very actively engaged with those students who live there. Uh, I think to the extent we can, we want to create a greater identity for the Mount Vernon campus so that students see that uh, as not just a place to live, but a place to, to have co-curricular activities, to engage with faculty, to engage with us. Uh, we hope to bring back a tradition we started in our dorm uh, which is uh, the house master's cook. Uh, so we, um, once a month, we actually cook breakfast for our entire dorm. Uh, not just cater it, we actually cook it. Uh, and we've been doing that for nine years. 
And so what we hope to do is bring back traditions like that. I think, again, it's this create as many opportunities for students to interact with us as faculty, and of course, Laurie and me as, as representatives of senior administration, as possible that are distinct from the classrooms. Because I think if students only see their, their educational life here as the classroom, we'll have done them a disservice. Uh, and I think they know it, we know it, and we understand, I understand faculty time is a precious resource. You know, they haven't made more than 24 hours in the day. We all, as faculty members, have enormous number of things competing for our attention. But I think we have to sort of take a deep breath at times and keep our eyes on that bigger picture, which is eventually uh, we own the responsibility for educating our students. Nobody else can do it. And we need to know them in as many ways as we can, including these co-curricular activities. So I'm personally deeply committed to it. We'll spend time on it uh, and we'll be a, a cheerleader for other faculty and wherever possible help make available resources that are necessary to do it. I, I will reveal to everybody that when I told my eight-year-old daughter that you cook pancakes every month and there's a different theme every month. She's been rooting for you <laughs> and, she's been say, and she's been rooting for the month of February. Why, why February? Well, because February it has two different parts. We just finished the February breakfast last weekend. So February is cherry pancake and chocolate pancakes. <laughs> First question, for those who might have heard it, was, is this a promotion for me? And I have to say, yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the truth. Um, the role, uh, uh, MIT is a very odd and almost completely idiosyncratic use of the word chancellor as a title. Uh, and I serve as the vice chancellor, there's only one of them. Uh, the chancellor at MIT actually, the closest I would say here uh, in most other standard universities would be the vice president or dean for student affairs. Uh, so it consists of three offices, the dean for undergraduate education, the dean for graduate education, and the Dean for Student Life, all are part of the office of the Chancellor. I don't know of any other place that does that. Uh, the academic deans, uh, as your, your nine school deans equivalently here, uh, in the structure I come from, uh, report to the provost, as they will now here. Uh, so in terms of scope, this is, I'll be quite honest, a bigger job uh, for me. And everything I've done in the last 34 plus years as a faculty member, I hope has prepared me for it. Uh, I will say you know, the excitement of this job partly stemmed from integrating both the student life education areas with the larger provostorial functions, which more which traditionally revolve around working with the school deans. And so uh, the scope of this is quite a bit larger. And as I've said in my introductory remarks, this university, my new university, is larger than my old one uh, in terms of student body, in terms of breadth of disciplines it covers, in terms of having professional schools. And to be honest, that's what excited me as well. Uh, it is a bigger arena. It is a, in some ways, uh, has aspects that are vastly more relevant to some societal issues. Uh, and uh, I am just energized by the idea of becoming engaged with us. Yeah, please. Good morning, Abdul Yusuf, Chairman of Computer Science. Um, well, I want to welcome you to GW. Um, welcome, actually, to the senior leadership of the transformation that we're undergoing at GW. Um, GW is not alone, actually, in being sort of undergoing this transformation. Pretty much all of the universities in the United States and in the world um, have to adjust to the new demands of the 21st century. So what do you see as the new role of the university generally? not just UW alone, uh, in the new century, and how are we positioned to basically uh, make those changes? Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I think the, the, I don't know whether I characterize it as a completely new role, but I would characterize it as a tremendous increase in the importance of a role. The wealth of nations now is not built on their physical resources. And we have enormous example, a range of examples that demonstrate that. We have what had been an ascendant Japan with no natural resources. There are the Singapores of the world, which have high growth rates. The wealth of nations rests inside between the ears of their people. And the universities, collectively and individually, are the place where people acquire the short-term skills and the long-term ways of thinking that make them effective in the knowledge economy. And so our responsibility, I think, 
first and foremost to our students, is to prepare them from a world in which the ability to think agilely, the ability to integrate different ways of thinking, the ability to uh, look at problems from diverse viewpoints and develop resolutions, the ability to work in a global context, not just a national or a regional one, is going to be crucial to the success of our country, and frankly, every other nation is uh, thinking the same way. Uh, we face far more competition in this century from abroad. The truth is, certainly post-World War II, the American higher education system uh, was and has been uh, by far the most effective and dominant. That may not be true in this century. Uh, the investments being made in higher education in the rapidly developing emerging economies are substantial. And when you visit places like Tsinghua University, or go to the Middle East and go to places like uh, Kaust University. You see investments being made of a scale in universities that really we're not matching. And so we're not in the future, I think, going to get that excited just looking at the US News and World Report rankings because those rankings are gonna miss some of our competition. I think what's going to become more important is, for many of our students is, should I come to George Washington or should I go to Beijing University if I'm Chinese? And we're going to see more and more English language programs growing in these countries, and the student who might have come to us uh, may look at these other universities where previously they would only aspire to come to a great American university. They're going to be looking at great Singaporean universities, great Chinese universities. We as a university have to be prepared to be stellar, not just in the American context, but in the global context. And we have to reach out and prepare our students to function in a society where most of the jobs out there will engage people uh, globally. I had a conversation uh, with the former CEO of Citicorp, John Reed. And one of the things John said was fascinating. He said, virtually none of the senior leadership of Citicorp includes anybody who isn't bilingual at least. He said there was one of the like 16 or 17, I believe he said, I forget the exact number, senior executives who wasn't bilingual. Many of them had grown up in multiple cultures. And if any one of their executives did almost all their career in one country, they never would make it to the senior leadership. Well, more and more of our companies are like that. Even companies we think of as traditionally domestic, like Boeing, for example. Well, Boeing has manufacturing all over the world. They have to in order to sell into the global market. And our students need to understand how to function that way. So I think we're facing enormous challenges. The good news is we're starting from a position of strength. We're not playing catch up. But if we are complacent, I will promise you that these other universities will come walking over our backs and the next you know, 20 or 30 years, the list of great universities, we'll see American universities drifting off the list and these other universities going on it. That doesn't mean that's inevitable. Just we have to make the right decisions. We need to encourage investment in our university from the government, from donors, uh, and, and convey that message that American universities are central and crucial to the economic development of this country. And the alternative is, is a stagnation that I think all of us would find unacceptable, but could happen unless we are consciously aware of the need to continue to push forward. I do. Thank you. Uh, so I'll repeat the question, which is my thoughts about, uh, actually the question was plans, but I, I guess I would not say I have yet a plan. Uh, I'll tell you more my thoughts uh, about the development of young faculty and expansion of their research. Well, first of all, I, I think central to that is the question of mentoring. So I'll tell a short story, well, I'll keep it very short, uh, which is the way I got the first research grant ever as a young faculty member, uh, first grant I think happened in late 1975, early 1976, but it didn't happen because cold I wrote a proposal to some government agency. It happened because a senior colleague came to my office and said, you know, I know the work you're doing because he helped hire me, uh, and I know someone in the Department of Transportation who I think would be interested in your research. And he introduced me to then was a deputy director, a deputy administrator of the Urban Mass Transit Administration at the time. And he made that introduction. And I explained, he sort of encouraged me to explain my research. 
and he talked about what the faculty member talked about why he thought this was valuable, and that was my first grant. It was a modest grant, as first grants usually are, uh, but the important part of the story is that the fa senior faculty member, who was extremely experienced in obtaining research funds, still is uh, on the MIT faculty, uh, took the time out to mentor me. Now, he wasn't there to give grand advice. Sometimes mentors do that. He wasn't there to solve my personal issues. And for him, he wasn't assigned to do this, by the way. He just saw a young faculty member down the hall and did it. I think that's part of the culture we need to infuse. I think the other reality is the modern uh, becoming a faculty member today, particularly in the sciences or anything that requires experimental equipment, requires startup funds. Uh, first of all, to attract those faculty here, we need to provide startup funds. So we're always going to be looking for where do we find the money, where do the department heads, the deans, and the provost find money to give faculty that jump start uh, of research funds that they're going to need to be successful. The failure to do so just sets people up to failure to fail. There's no sense bringing in great people if you're not going to resource them the way they need to be successful. But it's surprising that it didn't require any money for the senior faculty member to come into my office and do this. He just did. Uh, and I've been forever grateful for that. Uh, and uh, I've talked to him about it. And I think that's, uh, that is a responsibility of the senior faculty to do that. And it's sort of easy to forget that. And so one of my hopes is uh, to work with certainly the deans and department heads some of that can be formalized a bit. I think every faculty member should have more than one mentor. Uh, mentors are, are extraordinarily useful. Uh, sometimes you ignore their advice if you're a young faculty member. That's okay, but you should get the advice. Uh, and so I, I would hope that we would look at the mentoring processes around the university for young faculty. Uh, and then I think there are central offices that can help connect faculty to possible funding sources. So part of the development organization, uh, I think connect people to foundation funding. Foundation funding is a growing area. Uh, it's complicated because most foundations will not pay uh, full indirect costs. Some of them won't pay any indirect costs. Uh, and so there are questions there of providing those resources uh, with foundation funding, but we have to participate within that because we're not going to ignore the Gates Foundation and all the other U.S. foundations and international foundations. So all of those things can help get that faculty member. In the end, the only reason to hire them is to make them successful. Right? It doesn't do any good to bring in people and have them fail. So we might as well do it right, uh, and we need to be very conscious of it. Uh, Rob? Oops. Dr. Lorman, welcome. Uh, thanks. Welcome again. Uh, we're especially delighted to have you and uh, Mrs. Lerman living at the Mount Vernon campus. Thought I'd ask you for your impressions of the campus and what you think, uh, how it can fit into the GW community. Thanks. Well, First of all, uh, now I can do a confession. Before my first visit here, I didn't know we had a Mount Vernon campus, but that's my, no, that's my bad, not, not anybody else's. Uh, but the, I went out there. First of all, it's a fantastic physical facility. It's, it's quite beautiful, uh, to be honest. Uh, we know there are limits to growth in Foggy Bottom. Uh, President Knapp has talked to me about that, and many of you have actually mentioned it. It's not that we can't grow somewhat here, but uh, there are clear boundaries. And of course, the Virginia campus is another part of the picture. Uh, and I've been out to visit that and had a tour and it was, uh, got a great education uh, on that. So speaking about the speaking of Vernon campus, I think the key there is that we need to be a little more deliberate about creating what I call an identity for the campus that it isn't just some dorms. Now, there already is some programs there that are linked to that. The Women's Leadership Program is clearly linked to that. Uh, I need to understand that better. But I think we need to do more programmatically that's grounded in the Mount Vernon campus so that it is a long-term desirable alternative for some subset of our students. Uh, and so there's uh, as much of an active sense of campus community there. Uh, and in particular, uh, I would very much like uh, to have enough programmatic activities by choosing perhaps some disciplines or other areas that focus there so that uh, more and more upperclassmen want to be on that campus and that the freshmen there get the benefit of having not just another cohort of freshmen but everybody all four years there. Uh, and so I think we need to look strategically at, at how we can, you know, what can we select that makes sense for that campus to be the center of gravity for it, in addition, of course, to the, the programs that are already there. Uh, and I think if we can do that, we can leverage this 
fantastic physical asset, even more than we do now. Uh, on the Virginia campus, I'll just sort of make up a new question, which is not the one you answered. You asked, of course. Uh, I think the key there is the, that facility is and should be identified as a research facility. And we should continue to, to grow and enhance it uh, as a, a fantastic place to grow out additional research groups at large scale because that can't happen on Foggy Bottom and at the large scale of a major research facility. So one of the things you learn when you schedule 22 back-to-back -back interviews where people are not supposed to see each other is that you need to stop on time. Uh, but thank you very much. <laughs>